Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well. I'm logging on about three minutes early, just kind of giving, giving um, everyone a chance to, uh, to jump on if they want to get on this morning. I uh, thought yesterday, I'm gonna go ahead and bring a, a message um, today. You know, we're not having, we haven't been having physical uh, Sundays, you know, we haven't been having it physically on location, but I wanna keep um, resources coming your way. And I, you know, decided to go ahead and do something this morning first thing, a little bit earlier, so I know it's probably a tough time for a lot of people. I've often wondered, you know, who would actually be able to jump on when I do it live because I know a lot of people are getting ready uh, to head to church, go to the AM service, but, you know, this will be out there for anybody who wants to, to watch it a little bit later. You know, you may just, you know, want to, you know, have a little devotion a little bit later on and, you know, this will uh, hopefully serve you well. Um, if you have your Bible, um, if you're watching this later on, we're going to be in 1 Peter this morning. We're going to be looking at a couple of different passages, uh, but we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning. That's where our foundational text is going to come from, and I'm going to end up sharing something from a, one of my favorite devotions I use each day called Daily with the King. It was really, really popular with my dad. My dad loved it. I think he read it seven years straight, and... Um, Roughly, roughly seven years consecutive, I think he's been in and out of this every day. And he was constantly quoting it, um, constantly referencing Daily with the King. And I, I saw the way that this devotion had impacted his life and how some of these truths had become so anchored in him. And I, I think in all, in all honesty, that, that's what it takes. A lot of times we, it's not what we read, it's what we study, and it's what we meditate upon over and over and over again. And we get that truth deep down inside of us to where that truth becomes a, a reality in our life. I'll be back in just one moment. Hold on a second. Sorry about that. I was getting some background noise. I had to go to go deal with. I'm doing this in my home this morning, so <laughs> I'm actually going to start at 930, you know, whether anybody's here or not. This will be out there. This will be uploaded and ready for anybody who wants to to watch this and to dig into it. But yeah, as I was saying, uh, he just was really impacted by, by that devotion. And, and last, uh, I guess it was last year or so, we had a Bible study going on at his house he moved, he left his home. He sold the, the home that he had out in Ruffin that was on all that land and all that property. Some of you have probably seen the pictures. He left that home in 2017 and and moved um, to a, a, another home close by. It was like built on the property, but he didn't live there for about a year before moving to Chatham. He was living out on Franklin Turnpike. And, uh, you know, in 2019, we were we were very blessed to have a lot of time together um, just studying. I, I, I'm so thankful to have had that time with him, and we had that time studying in 2019. Uh, we did a did a long Bible study that took up, you know, a few months, and it was it was great. But during that time, I, I heard him constantly referencing. Uh, here's the picture of it. it's really beautiful, referencing daily with the King, and uh, I finally just. I just said, Dad, I got to get this devotion, you know, and I, I bought it and I, I got him to sign it for me. And uh, it's really special to me now. I have, I have this, uh, this, he signed, he, you know, he filled out the back of it for me. And it just, I don't know, it's, I like to almost read it every day now. <laughs> um, I've seen that we've had a couple of people to join. It, Facebook's not telling me who it is, but I want to say good morning to you. And uh, I'm glad you were able to to make it today. I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited about what I will be sharing in this uh, short but sweet um, Sunday school we'll be having this morning, and I pray that it's a, a blessing to your life. We'll go ahead and get started. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm um, going to be reading several passages, probably uh, 4 through four through 10. Yeah, passages 4 through 10, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse 4. The scripture says, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Talking about Christ. Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. 
Then it says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. What does that mean to be a holy priesthood? It means to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. You know, in the Old Testament, the priesthood, you know, offered up sacrifices, actual physical sacrifices. Well, all of that was a foreshadowing of many things to come. Number one, it was a foreshadowing of Christ being our great high priest. He was the ultimate sacrifice that was offered. But we as believers are also a, a royal priesthood, the Bible says. Think about this. You know, the high priest would, would intercede for the people in prayer. He would offer sacrifices. He would enter into God's presence. Well, we do all of these things now as believers under the new covenant. We, we, uh, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice every day. We, are, we, we intercede for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we, through Jesus, can also access the throne of God. That is a wonderful thing. We are being built up a holy priesthood, a spiritual house. Therefore, it's also contained in the scripture. Now, Peter is getting ready to quote Isaiah. He says, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So if you are a believer, if you are trusting Christ, if you have trusted him, if you are trusting him, um, you're not going to be put to shame. And look here in verse 7, it says, Therefore, to you who believe he is precious. So you have nothing to be ashamed of. You're not going to be put to shame. The, the, uh, your spiritual nakedness is not going to be revealed because you are going to be dressed in the, the clothing of his righteousness. That's why it says that's, that's to you who believe that he is precious, that he is a precious stone. There's no shame in your future. But to those who are disobedient, to those who are disobedient, when the scripture talks about disobedience, it always parallels disobedience with unbelief. In the book of Hebrews, it says it, it does a little flashback to the Israelites who were, who were journeying through the peril of the wilderness, and it said many of them did not get to enter the promised land because of unbelief. But also in the same, in the same paragraph that that's being referenced, it also says they were unable to enter because of disobedience. So all through the scripture, disobedience and unbelief tend to be a parallel. Um, disobedience is always the result of unbelief. Um, but ultimately, disobedience regarding the rejection of Christ is the ultimate unforgivable sin, obviously, because if we don't come to Christ, if Christ does not become our righteousness, if, if we don't trust in Jesus, if we don't believe the gospel message, then we are unbelieving and disobedient, which is the highest level of disobedience. And it says to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief corner stone, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. It says they stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. That's very deep. Verse nine says, but you are a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're chosen by God. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, which means you're a set-apart people. You're his own special people. Why? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I love that so much. That's poetic. You, his own special people, to proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness. He called you out of it. He, he called your name. You heard the shepherd's voice. You came out of that darkness. He called you out of that grave. Hallelujah. And into his marvelous light. Verse 10 says, Who once, you once were not a people, but now you're the people of God. You once had not obtained mercy, but now you've obtained mercy. That's a that's a beautiful, I just love this, this portion of scripture, which I, I love all of scripture, and I especially love 1 Peter. I know we've been referencing 1 Peter a lot in our Sunday school. I do see Jesse Robinson out there. Good morning, bro. I hope you're doing well. I don't know why it's not showing me uh, the other names, but I'm, I'm saying hello to you as well. <laughs> now, 
The title of this devotion this morning, uh, this Sunday school lesson, is A Stumbling Stone or a Building Stone. Which is Jesus to you? Is he a stumbling stone or is he a building stone? I think sometimes he can be both. And I'm going to read from Daily with the King today. I just think this is extraordinary. I was I was reading through this and I was like, you know, I really want to build my Sunday school lesson uh, upon this material today because I think, I think that really speaks. Now, as believers, as believers in Christ, we're not auditioning anymore. We've been accepted in the beloved. We have placed our faith in Christ. We've been saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, is the gift of God, not of works, lest we boast. But the scripture goes on to say we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that God had prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in one sense, Christ is really never our, our stumbling stone. But as believers in this process of being a workmanship and growing in our grace and growing in obedience, there are times when, when our Lord can be a stumbling stone to us. There are plenty of times where, where Christ is not, a, he's a stumbling stone to me, depending upon my perception or which path I try to take. We as believers can get out of the will of God. And I'm thankful that when we do, he brings us back to himself in loving discipline. Finally seeing some names out there. Jamel, Riley, good morning. So glad to have y'all. What a blessing. So we're going to be talking today about stumbling stone or building stone, question mark. So this portion of devotion that I want to read comes from actually the January 23rd titled Skinned Shins and Bruised Knees. Now, Glenn Evans in Daily with the King says this. He says, Lord, do I know you as my stumbling stone or my building stone? If I am not properly related to you, I will surely stumble over you as Peter did in Matthew 26, 31. How often you have been offensive to me, Lord, when I wanted my own way. You offended me when I wanted to choose certain friends or other things that the flesh craved and you would not allow it. Jesus was a stumbling stone at that time. There is only one place for the foundation stone or there is only one place for the foundation stone or the cornerstone. If it is not in its proper place, I will stumble over it repeatedly. I find that when I do not put you in your proper place, the result is pain. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Mm -mm. Your cross, Lord, is often offensive to me, just as it was to Peter. I often crave a glory religion, glory religion, a religion of feeling, fame, joy, and happiness. I do not like a cross religion the drudgery and misery of dealing with people deep in their sins and failures. I do not like saying no to myself. I do not like being put on a cross. Peter wanted a kingdom and position and power. So do I, and so do you so often. He could not bear to see it all go down the drain via the cross. How often he heard himself stumbling over you. <laughs> Jesus is either a building stone or he's a stumbling stone. And when we step out of the way, when we step out of the will of God, he becomes a stumbling block. But listen to this. Yet I read, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. We see that in Hebrews 12 too. Jesus endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. Jesus found joy in that miserable cross while I shun it. Mm. while we shun it. Sometimes we shun the cross that we're supposed to carry. I was listening to, uh, I love Audrey Asad. I, I know I share some of her stuff from time to time on YouTube. She's one of my, actually, she's put out one of my favorite albums of all time. It's called, um, oh, gosh, what's the name of that record? It'll come to me in a minute. It's, it's, it's one of my all-time favorites. Um, but, uh, Anyway, one of the songs talks about carrying a cross, and she says, as, as I carry this cross, you 
carry me. As I carry this cross, you carry me. Now, Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and now he sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus found joy in that miserable cross while I shun it. Not only that, listen to this, but via the cross, he found victory sitting at God's right hand. God will not deny me victory or power. He desires that for me. But he says, I will get these things only by enduring the cross. So if I keep bumping up against God, something is wrong with me. If my feet are bruised, it is because I am rebelling, not submitting. But if I submit, the joy of the cross will see me through many a dark day. Isn't that something how something as grueling, grueling and trying as the cross can bring such joy when we as believers embrace our cross? This joy is not the cross itself, but its aftermath. For God always deals with ends, final realities, not routes to them. I look for God's end, my posterity through my cross today. Matthew 10, 38 says, he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me, okay? Now, in America today, we see a, a crossless Christianity. And I think sometimes we ourselves are bad at creating a crossless Christianity. I don't think the blame always lies at the feet of the pastor or the feet of the church itself or any particular sector of the church. I think a crossless form of Christianity is something that our flesh is so um, eager to embrace. But my friends, the Christian life, uh, although filled with joy, purpose, eternal meaning, eternal comfort and consolation, we, we do have a cross to bear. And this cross consists of a lot of things. Throughout our life, our faith is tested and tried to test its genuineness. Throughout our life, we, we go through so many different uh, forms of God's discipline. We go through so many different tests. We go through loss. I'm going through great loss right now. We go through so many different things in life, and we're, we're carrying our cross to the finish line. But as, as I referenced in that Audrey Aside song, as we carry this cross, you carry me. And um, it's just uh, the cross in and of itself is not what we consider beautiful. It's the aftermath of the cross. It's what the cross produces. Jesus said, if anyone's going to be my disciple, let him deny himself. Most of the problems that I run into in my Christian life come from failure of self-denial most of the time. A lot of times we put ourselves at the forefront and it always brings us trouble as believers. It's The Christian life is marked by this, this thing of self-denial. The Bible says, for you died and your new life is hidden with Christ and God. The scripture says, we must deny ourselves, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And the Christian life often comes with a cross. Um, you know, we've, we've heard that song before, you know, you never said the cross would not get heavy at times. You know, sometimes the cross gets heavy. Um, but as we carry it, we are being carried. The Lord promises to finish the good work that he began in us. The scripture says that God is working in us both to will and to do for his own good pleasure. But the truth is, Sometimes in our Christian life, you know, Jesus can be a stumbling stone to us. Sometimes he's a cornerstone. Sometimes he's a building stone. But, you know, all through our Christian life, we step out of the will of God from time to time. Sometimes we, we try to go our own way. And when we do that, we notice that Christ and his love becomes a stumbling stone. I want to stumble if I'm not doing what is right. You know, the wicked, uh, oftentimes you hear the Bible talking about how the wicked prosper. And, and a lot of times the wicked are not interrupted. The wicked are just able to go and do what they want to do uh, because the, in, Psalms, in, in Psalm 73, the Bible says that God has prepared a slippery slope for them. But aren't you thankful, brother, sister in Christ, when you step off the path that Christ is your stumbling stone? And he's not just a stumbling stone when you step off the path. 
he, he's a stumbling stone that, that works to get you back on the building stone, to get you back on the living stone. And you know, I don't know about you, but in my day-to-day -day life, I want Christ to be my building stone. Uh, I want less and less over time for him to be a stumbling stone to me. And the only way we stumble over him is when we, we step out of God's will. As believers, we must take up our cross, and uh, that cross, although difficult, has a beautiful end. And I think deep down inside of our hearts, there's there's contentment and there's peace and there's consolation. You know, the scripture constantly talks about God's comfort amidst our sufferings. And not only that, he comforts us in our sufferings so that we can comfort those who suffer. So in closing, I want to encourage you today to take up your cross and be a disciple. Embrace the will of God, even when it gets difficult. Because as a believer, there's no getting around the will of God. When we try to do that, we only stumble. We stumble over that great living stone. But you and I are in Christ. The scripture says we are. We are, we are not of those who stumble. We are this chosen generation. We're this royal priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices to God, interceding and entering his presence. We're a set-apart nation. We're his own special people. The Bible says we, we once were not a people, but now we are. We once had not received mercy, but now we have. We've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So now Christ can be our living stone, our building stone, and not a stumbling stone. I love all of you. I hope this message was a blessing to you. Embrace Jesus today. Embrace the cross Embrace whatever valley you got to go through. I know I'm referencing a lot of songs this morning, but I think there was a, a, a song by, I think the girl's name was Jenny Owens. She put this song out that said, I will go through the valley if you want me to. What a wonderful thing. And with Christ, as he, as he carried his cross and kept his eyes on the prize, we'll carry our cross and, and keep our eyes on the prize, looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Take care.